Um, let's talk a little bit about the new album. I, um, I heard quite a bit from it and uh, it's got some great, great music on it. Uh, it's not, some of it, ha it has like that stick sound, but you go through, you have a couple different influences here. Would you mind describing a little bit of the influences that you've had? Because I know you've had a, a long career prior to joining Styx uh, in Canada. And uh, once you join Styx, you just sort of fit right in uh, very nicely. But uh, the band has evolved. Um, and, I, and I see that evolution um, in, in, the, in the, the, the new album. So why don't you describe a little bit of it for me? Well, Aaron, that's that that that's a lot to uh, what to say. It's a lot to unpack. <laughs> that's okay, it. that's okay. We're good. <laughs> so I would say first of all that um, uh, you know, as far as influences go, the the part of sticks that I was most attracted to back when I joined the band, which is mm -hmm. over twenty two years ago now, uh, it was the kind of the progressive leanings of the band. You know, so that's been the corner that I've always kind of tried to champion, and. And to to that's the the little part of my agenda that I'm trying to put forward, and right. luckily these guys are very musically ad 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 adaptable and, and flexible when it comes to uh, when it comes to various styles of music. Right. And, uh, but you know, in, in the in the initial, you know, ten years of 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 being with the band, touring was was absolutely the the most central. Uh, uh, of, of the most central importance. So we focus so much on the live show and basically how we interact with each other on stage. By the time we got to 2015, it was the music industry had, had changed again where things looked much more positive as far as making new music. Right. And um, a partner that uh, Tommy Shaw had worked with in the past at Will Ivankovich came in to be kind of a, an, an outside producer so that we didn't basically devolve into... Uh, uh, you know, squabbles of trying to produce yourself as a band. Sure. Will was extremely good at, at kind of going through the, the various musical um, leanings of each guy in the band and analyzing a lot of what, what they could bring to the, to the table, so to speak. And he's a great writer as well. And we began to cobble together things that, that sounded very much like they were <clears throat> in, te in, in keeping with the classic rock tradition of sticks and yet reflected the band as it has evolved as you put it Aaron earlier the the, the evolution of the band that's that's uh, been undergone since uh, for, you know for the last couple of decades and as a result we came up with the album the mission which i think was a very strong statement for us to uh, and very reflective of where the band is today and curious, curiously enough it tied so seamlessly to our ears anyway, with the, the classic rock era and particularly the, you know, the, the grand, grand illusion pieces of eight, that era of the band, <clears throat> you could put the two albums on side by side and not feel necessarily a jarring uh, shift in, in tonality. Yes, yes, uh, pieces only... of eight is one of my favorite stick albums. Yeah, that, that would be my number one as well. That'd yeah. be my number one. So that's the one that I, I generally hold things up against to, to kind of do a quality check. So right. <laughs> So um, when when we were done with the mission, we felt that it, it you know passed those little tests, and the reaction from the audience was really responsive and, and positive, and to the point where we got to after about a year of the album being out, we got to to playing some shows where we would play that album in its entirety. We right. did a few of those in Las Vegas, and uh, we did one in Boston, and we were about to do one in New York when the pandemic hit. But anyway, that kind of led us straight into the success of that record that universal records said you know we'd like to get another album from you guys you know of, the, of a, a similar uh, you know direction we like what you're doing so we worked on this album prior to the pandemic we actually worked on had all the songs kind of cobbled out all except two cobbled out and kind of mapped out in 2019 ready for us all to get together in the studio and <clears throat> go through them together and uh, and that eventually became Crash of the Crown because after a few months of pandemicry, <laughs> if that's a word, um, we decided, you know, these Zoom calls are becoming so second nature, just the way you and I are speaking right yeah, now. Sure. You, you could just as easily be in the next room to me, right? And um, 
In fact, are you? I'm in 227. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, um, so as, as it turns out, we, this became so second nature and so effortless that I would be recording in Toronto in my, you know, I have a great studio there and, uh, you know, equal to what, what, what they were working in, in Nashville. And Todd was in his, uh, one of the most sophisticated drum rooms on earth in, in Austin, Texas. And he did his drums from there. Ricky Phillips, James Young, and uh, Chuck Pinazzo all individually drove to, um, to uh, uh, Nashville and finished their parts. But we really had scoped out so much of the record by doing it like this, uh, you know, for and recording it for real. Again, with with Will being the uh, the producer of the record and kind of um, keeping uh, traffic control. <laughs> sure, sure. I mean, uh, but as far as like the song, like just the title track, Crash of the Crown, I yeah. hear a little Queen in there. I hear yeah. all sorts of yeah. like great little influences. And I think it expands mm. the sound so much. I think it, it makes it more accessible. I veered off your question. Exactly. The, the, the part of the, the writing process, part of the performance of it is looking at the whole progressive rock era and, and kind of seeing what from that era still, still really is relevant and has stayed with people. So we're, we are big fans of Pink Floyd and Queen and Genesis and yep. you know, Emerson Lake and Palmer and Jethro Tull. We're all fans of that, that music. And, but you'll notice that those are all British bands. And, and one of the most notable things about Styx to my mind is that they were the first non UK band to be successful doing <clears throat> a progressive rock style. Yes. <clears throat> Later on, Kansas did it and uh, you know other bands as well, but to varying degrees. But that's my, that, that to me is one of the strengths of Styx. So when it came to uh, say Crash of the Crown, yeah, we could hear we could hear many influences coming in there, but it's still ultimately, you know, I've had pr plenty of people say, wow, that sounds like Mercury at the end. And it doesn't really. It sounds like, <laughs> no. it sounds like myself, but it sounds like me basically you doing the, what, what I feel that that bravado that Freddie Mercury brought to so many rock pieces. And I think is, is was yeah. vital and fit with the lyrics of Crash of the Crown. Similar to, if I can make an analogy, sure. you know, in the Beatles career, I'm going to compare it to that. You know, Paul McCartney would say on, for example, Oh, Darling, you know, he's doing he's doing something between Little Richard and Fats Domino. I think that those are the two that he mentioned. And you can hear those influences in there quite, quite easily, you know, and, uh, you know, that's basically plundering from the era that first inspired them and then pulling it forward, you know, 10 or 11, 12 years, whatever it was. Uh, and and using those influences to um, to shape what they're doing today. You know, I remember even John Lennon on, on his last album, uh, Starting Over, he would refer to that song, Starting Over, as the Orbison song because he felt it had such a great Orbison influence to it. You know, it's been so long since you took the time. You know, so I, I think that's well within the bounds of what's acceptable is that, is that those influences are, are allowed to come through if you can uh, kind of deliver them to a way where the rest of the band aren't, uh, you know, rolling their eyes, but instead looking <laughs> at them, I like that. Yeah, I think, uh, I think it has a great, there's a great balance between the prog elements and the, and the pop and the rock elements throughout yeah. the entire album. Yeah. Um, I think one of the critiques that I heard was that a lot of the songs are, are short. Um, I, yeah, I don't I, believe that. The first time in my career, I mean, we talk about this. It's funny that I've never had the criticism in my life that the songs are too short. Never have I ever heard that. <laughs> That is that is one that, that that does seem to come up quite often. It's quite uh, quite honestly, and it's by design in a lot of ways. First of all, we could easily have made amalgamated two or three of the songs into, and called it one song. That would have right. been easy because they they flow really really seamlessly one into the other. Although there are fifteen songs, the, re the record's only forty plus minutes long, right. like any album, right? Yep. Because you've got two sides, there's roughly 20 minutes per side, a little bit more. And, um, you know, if the songs are too short, I tell people, 
you just move the needle back and play it again. That'd be twice. <laughs> well, that's, you know? that's why I like, I mean, I personally, I love the fact that you get to the point when, when you get to the chorus, you, you, you have the melody laid out and it doesn't necessarily need to repeat three, four times before, right. you, you know, it, it sinks in your head. The whole, right. I mean, that's, that's my thing. And I, I review power pop music where a three minute gem is exactly what you want. And I think that's pretty much what Sticks has on Crash of the Crown and a few other songs there. And, um, you know, I think it's great, you know, and, and it's also uh, easier and more digestible for yeah. someone who's listening to it and, and getting it right away. It also works really well for, for working any of these songs into the live show because, you know, it's, it's a tough set list to crack. Quite honestly. <laughs> and so, for example, we, we opened these shows, these last 50 shows. We did our 50th show of 2021 last night. And uh, right. we opened the shows with Fight of Our Lives, which opens Crash of the Crown. Before you know it, because it's only about a minute and a half long, it's already segued straight into Blue Collar Man. So you have the, the current state of the band and where we are, you know, uh, philosophically, musically, however you want to describe that immediately you know <clears throat> bonded with this classic piece from the past that people have uh, you know are dying to hear so it's amazing to, to see that particularly this year it's amazing th th how people they want the familiar so badly they're hungry for those familiar uh, emotions yeah. that, that come up at a rock show and at the same time you can tell because of what everyone's been through we want something new. We want something that, that feels new and yet familiar. And I think Crash of the Crown uh, is is providing that for them in, in the show. It's just, I'm judging strictly by the response that we've had to it. Yeah, I know. And, and I'm going to say, and I've heard this from other bands from you know the 70s era that really have not done it successfully. I mean, a, an example, unfortunately, is Boston, who have come out with albums after their you know heyday in the in the 90s, in the new century to in 2000s then honestly tried to bring back that sound but didn't quite do it i think sticks succeeds here with what they did in in that sense of bringing that old sound but updating it it's not like fans are clamoring saying you know give us something brand new but if they hear it they don't say oh i don't want to hear this that, bring back the old right. hits they right. want to hear they say wow this sounds just like it would fit with my old hits comfortably <laughs> you know it's and, like put peanut butter on my jelly don't put you know pickles on it and and that's how i look at it and, it, and it's comfort food it's musical yeah, that's, comfort that's food and it fits beautifully I, I i like the way you put that that's a very good way you put that it's like it's like i'm not really hungry but now that you've made this beautiful peanut butter sandwich and you did it right <laughs> thanks <laughs> I'm kind of liking it. That is kind of, I think that kind of sums up, <laughs> I'm going to have to pull that forward. That does sum up a lot of the attitude of the audience. I'm the same way. I remember going to certain concerts where I'm like, you know, Elton, don't, don't play me that new thing that you're working on right now because <laughs> it's gonna it's, I'm going to mislead on or something like that, you know, or pocket man or goodbye, you know, but instead, once he gets into it, I'm like, Oh God, this is really cool. I really like what this is doing. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm speaking of a concert. I saw him in October of 2019. Same thing happened. He'd play a couple of things that I was unfamiliar with that were newer. That I was like, oh, come on, man. And then you're like, oh, wow, this is really great. I got to go check this out. It was that it was really strong. So that is the mindset when you when you're a devoted <clears throat> follower of a band. You you are instinctively reluctant to to let anything uh not reluctant but but you're you're judge, prejudging anything new that comes in because it upsets your little paradigm of what's of right what it is, you know? I, no no that, that uh, works fine so i mean uh the next question i would have or final question yeah. would be so what is uh next for the band and also i, I didn't get into the songwriting and how uh, you guys divvy up the duties of the songwriting. Is it is it a democracy? Is or is it you know or is it TJ basically like you're doing this and that? It, no, it, it's you know I went down for I think five separate writing sessions. What when I say go down? I, I live in Toronto, so I go to Nashville, and it would be Tommy and uh, and Will and myself, 
And um, for, for example, they had a great kind of riff that Ricky Phillips had come up with, and they'd already finished off this song, uh, Coming Out the Other Side, which I really liked, and I, I, I was really glad when they asked me to sing that one. But then I felt, oh, this needs, this needs something to, to set it up, to kind of tee it up. So I wrote this little piece called Lost at Sea. And the other, you know, they, they liked it and went, oh, this fits great together. And we came up with an arrangement for it. And then we jumped over and we, we had these little musical bits that the three of us had that eventually we jammed together into the title track, Crash of the Crown. And that's, that's basically a, about three or four days of, of navigating and negotiating and, and re, revamping and, and, and hacking through things until finally you've got smiles on all the faces. And that's kind of when you go, God, we could never have come up with that individually, but, but as, a, as a collective, you know, the three of us writing together, we came up with this song that, um, and that's kind of how it, how it works. So it's never the same twice. I can't kind of put it down to a formula. It's usually some little nugget that, 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 that sparks another nugget. I have to mention you because you have the sparks album cover there. Yep. I don't know if that's for my benefit or not, but you know, no, no, not really. It was from the last interview, believe it or not. I interviewed um, guys from Gleaming Spires who were in the Sparks band during the eighties. Um, yeah. <clears throat> you know, did that prior to, to this interview. Actually. I, I saw them. I saw them in the seventies because when I heard uh, this town ain't big enough for both of us, I was in high school, but I just loved it. And it wasn't on Canadian radio or, or anything, but we got a lot of British bands on import I know they're American, but anyway, they were. It was we thought they were British. Everybody and did. Everyone there. Did. That's what the movie. That's what the movie really uh, points out to it to to great to a great degree. I love that. I've gone to the movie now three times. <laughs> I'm a real. Fan. Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it twice myself. And you know the coffee shop you see them in. I I've met them a couple of times in that coffee shop in wow. LA. And this was prior to the movie. This is maybe starting about ten years ago. I wonder now that the movie's been out if they if they are able to have. I was the only person that went up and bugged them in the coffee shop. I'm like, I'm a, <laughs> I have kimono in my house. I have indiscreet. I have you know, I've got it. And I you know, would start singing songs to them from Little Beethoven, and they were like, okay, we get it. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going off on a little bit of a tangent, but tell Sorry. me a little bit about what's coming up next for for Sticks, and well, um, you know the possible future i mean you guys working on a new album or thinking about it yeah we're always working on new material that has always been the case ever since i joined the band there's always new things that are coming up you know because we you know sound check and and, and those kinds of ideas the challenge at this point aaron is going to be the where we carve out the time to begin to work on a new album because there just aren't enough days in the year to, to, for us to play all the shows that have been offered now that right. the pandemic is let's you know fingers crossed yeah. winding down and people are you know so hungry to get back out and, and and bring that back into their lives so we've played as i said we've played 50 shows so far i just looked at my itinerary for the next year and it's it's pretty it's pretty thick so it's going to be There'll be a lot of great ideas I know that will along the way and we'll begin to kind of gather wool of, of these ideas and, and turn them into an album at some point, but I can't say exactly when because it's going to be it's going to be live live. It'll be wild. Well, we look forward to the live shows. Uh, Lawrence Gowan, thank you very much for talking to me at Power Popaholic. I appreciate everything you do. Um, maybe in that next album you could, you know, bump up a little bit of the uh, you know the 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 heavy heavier rock aspect of it that I really like from your yeah. from your solo work um, that I haven't heard in a long while. But you know that that would be great too. Just you know put that very, in. <laughs> very likely since now we have three full on guitarists in the band. I have a feeling they're going to they're, they're going to uh, make their presence known. Uh, it it all comes down to what what fits with the overall theme or the overall. Uh, you know, arc of the album as to, you know, as to what winds up making it in there. You know, I don't great. mind, there, I don't mind there being a few more people pieces, but we all fight our own little corner. <laughs> That's great to hear. Well, thank you again so much, Lawrence Gowan of Sticks. Thank you for, for appearing. Thank you. All the best, Aaron. Take See care. You down the road. Okay. Bye. Bye.